of Holy and Whole Life Changing Ministries in Lansdowne, Virginia.
This is Pastor Michelle Thomas from Holy and Whole Life Change of Ministries right here in Lansdowne, Virginia. You are my strength, Lord. You are my sword, my shield, and my buckler. Lord, we ask that you come into this moment of time and feed us till we want no more. Father, we have a lot that we've come here with today. Lord, there are families who are hurting all over this land. There are families who are hungry all over this land. There are families who are suffering the loss of loved ones all over this hand, land. And Lord, I know that you are our healer. I know that you are our provider. I know that you are our strength in a time of storm. So God, meet us where we are. Meet us where we are. Heal us right where we are. We'll give you the glory. We'll give you the honor. Not when we come out of it, but while we're in it. Because we know that better is the ending of a thing than the beginning thereof. And so, Lord, we give you glory and honor for the victory on the other side of this. In Jesus' name, reach for us. Reach for us. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I just want to start by welcome you here to the Holy and Whole online service. And I need to acknowledge that our members have suffered a great loss today, actually this week, um, with the loss of um, Elder Maddie. And I say loss because it is a loss on this side, but heaven is a gain for heaven. And so we are blessed to have Addie Ma Elder Maddie with us for almost a decade, just serving and working in the Loudoun community. And so this morning we wanna send prayers of condolences and love to her daughters and granddaughters and all who have loved her um, over the years and all whom she served. Elder Maddie was a staple in Loudoun County. She's a graduate of the great Douglas alumni so for all of the Douglas alumni that may be tuning in this morning, we send our heartfelt condolences out to you. But we know that we are made better because of her life of service. We know that all of us whom Maddie have touched have, been, have encountered an angel. 
have encountered a sheer angel and we are grateful unto God. We are still in the process. The family is still in the process of making funeral arrangements. And so please stay tuned and look forward to that. Um, but I believe that the funeral will be held on this coming Saturday. So bless God. Um, I want you to hold your families just a little bit lo longer and a little bit tighter because no man knows the day or the hour. So we bless God for that. Listen, I have an exciting word to share for you. I don't know if you guys picked it up, but we've been on a series of sorts. I haven't um, officially announced this a series, but listen, after uh, the resurrection, um, there is a process that the uh, the disciples went on to gain power. And many of us have uh, gone through a crucifixion, if you will. This pandemic has crucified the entire world. It's crucified the economic industries. It's crucified uh, the healthcare industries. It's crucified all manner of financial industries. And I'm telling you, uh, the good news is I know we're going to recover. I know that we're going to rebound. And just like the disciples, we have to find our way. We got to find our way back to our purpose. We got to find our way to what God has called us to do. And it, if we do that, when we do that, recovery will come. Recovery will come. It's going to take power. It's going to take power. It's going to take Holy Ghost power. It's going to take, you know, new disciplines. Um, it's going to take all of us standing together and sharing in a way that we've never stood and shared together before. So I want to take you on a journey with me on the way to Pentecost. And if you would just turn your Bibles really quickly. Um, and let's see where we're going to be today. Uh, let's turn to John, the 21st chapter. John 21st chapter. How many people know that God is a good God? Do you know that God is a good God? Amen. He is a mighty good God. Last week we were doing 21. Uh, and uh, that where Jesus, um, that's where you find Jesus basically challenging Peter. And I don't know about you, but <laughs> all of us at some point or the other, we're going to find ourselves in the challenge of our lives. Sometimes it's, it's now, sometimes people think that this thing, this thing is the greatest challenge that you've ever been through. But I believe that there are still some challenges to come that is going to prove whether or not we love the Lord. How many people believe that? Amen. Do you believe that? I want to talk uh, for a few moments about. Um, I want to talk for a few moments about um, being temporarily reserved. Being temporarily reserved in this time of social distancing, we will see lots of things. Um, the Great Commission. Have you guys uh, heard of the Great Commission? The Great Commission is found in Matthew 28. Let me see where this says. Matthew 28. Can you turn your Bibles? I want you to hold Matthew, tw I'm sorry, John 21. So let's go to Matthew 28, the Great Commission. One of the things that's difficult when you're going through trials and, um, and I tell you what it is, it's focus. Have you guys found it difficult to focus in a pandemic? Have you really found it difficult to focus in a pandemic? Like you wake up with so much that you want to get done and all of a sudden it feels like nothing on your list is being accomplished. Have you ever experienced that? So it is with the disciples. The disciples have, uh, if you've trekked them, they have gone back and forth. You know, they went fishing and they went back to their old lives. They just could not pull it together. And so 
when things like that happen and things happen that are so disruptive to your life, the best thing that you can do is go back to the last thing that Jesus said. Oh, I wish I had somebody to agree that the best thing that you can do is go back to the last thing that Jesus said. I'm going to create for you a timeline before we jump right into this word, but I want to create for you a timeline for um, Easter or the resurrection to Pentecost, right? Pentecost is where they received power. Pentecost was where they were, the disciples were really uh, put on their foot. Um, in terms of being able to move forward completely with the power, with the confidence, with everything that they need to change the entire world. Pentecost was that day that started the rest of their lives that they would never turn back. And so um, if you remember uh, the day of their resurrection, uh, Mary Magdalene and um, Salome and Mary, the mother of James, they all came to the tomb to anoint Jesus. They felt like they were going to do their due diligence was, you know, and prepare his body. And uh, what they met was an empty tomb. Um, they then got the message to go and tell Peter and the others um, that he had risen. The angel told them to tell Peter and the others that, they, that Jesus had risen. And then um, uh, the actually there were four appearances that day so early in the morning that was the first appearance um the angel uh manifest themselves and said hey go get peter and the others and then sometime in that uh late morning afternoon on the road to emmaus there were two travelers and these two travelers encountered jesus and then there was, um, by late afternoon, there was the encounter with Jesus. And Jesus um, showed himself to Peter in Jerusalem, right? And then the fourth sighting of Jesus that same day was in the upper room when Jesus met the 11 disciples minus Judas in the upper room. A week later, a week later, uh, Jesus appeared um, to 11 disciples again. Um, and then there was the sighting at the, uh, at the Sea of Galilee, right? When um, they had gone back fishing, Peter and them and the disciples had gone back fishing. And then it gets to today. Yeah, yeah. The fourth encounter, the fourth encounter. That's where there's a mountaintop encounter with Jesus a mountaintop encounter with Jesus. We're going to talk about a little bit about that today. And then there's a fifth encounter where Jesus appeared to about 500 people. You can find that in 1 Corinthians 15 and 16. Um, and then Jesus appeared to James separately. And that's 1 Corinthians uh, 15 and 7. Jesus then for the finale, he ascends to heaven. You find that in Acts 1, 9 through 11. And then there's Pentecost, where the Holy Spirit hits the planet, where the Holy Spirit begins to fill the hearts of the believer and give them the power that they need to change the world. Let's jump in here, uh, the mountaintop experience. If you go to Matthew 28, 16 through 20, Jesus gives the great commission. Uh, the disciples find him on the mountaintop. He finds them on the mountaintop. And he begins to teach and instruct. I love the fact that after the crucifixion of Jesus and after he was raised from the dead, his job wasn't over. You know, not because he completed his physical assignment, there's a little bit more to do. How many people know that there's always something else to do? Amen. And so Jesus in those 50 days, he used 40 of those days for teaching, for teaching, for modeling, for making the disciples, right? Disciple ready. He was making the disciples disciple ready. 
right? And so here we find him giving them the commission because, of course, you know, they knew that their job was to continue to spread the gospel, but something had interrupted their lives. Something so devastating has interrupted their lives. I don't know who I'm talking about. I don't know who I'm talking to, but something so devastating has interrupted your life where you literally need Jesus to come back in and give you your assignment again. So this is where we are. Matthew 28, verse 16. Then the 11 disciples left for Galilee, going to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When he saw him, they worship him. Hmm. Then the 11 disciples left for Galilee, going to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshiped him. But some of them doubted. But some of them doubted. Jesus came and told his disciple, I have, be I have been given all authority in heaven and in the earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you and be sure of this. I am with you even to the end of the age. This is a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful lesson that Jesus is is teaching the disciples. And as I began to look at this lesson, I wondered if the 21st century church is able to still make disciples. Can we still make disciples? Are disciples still being made? And then you think about the time that we have with our families, the time that we are, you know, the government is shut down and this is the best time ever to make a disciple. Disciples are being made, whether you wanna believe them or not. You're gonna either be a disciple of Satan or you're gonna be the disciple of Jesus. Either you're gonna be the disciple of fear or you're gonna be the disciple of faith. Either you're gonna be the disciple of doubt, come on somebody, or you're gonna be the disciple of belief. Disciples are being made whether we like it or not. And so why not be an intentional? Why not be intentional about the type of disciple we want to become? I looked at this thing and I thought, I remember growing up, my father was a pastor and his mother was a pastor. So I'm third generation into this. And it looked like as I was growing up, disciples were easier to make than today. I don't know what it was, maybe because we didn't have the internet and it wasn't so many competing interests, but I'm telling you, I don't know if we didn't have anything else to do but to go to church, but I tell you one thing, people had, didn't have a problem following God, maybe because we didn't have as much money as we have and that we all had a common platform that America was in the best of times and the worst of times. And racism was, you know, something that affected everybody, that it wasn't too much of us. Hello, somebody that has made it. Hello, somebody that we had the good government jobs and this type. And so there wasn't a time, there was a time where people felt a need to be a disciple of Christ. Now they feel a need to be a disciple of self. People feel a need to be a disciple of self. And so this whole skill set of discipling has left the church. Come on, Antoine, just give me one, one amen. I mean, this whole skill set of discipling have literally left the church. Why? Because the 21st century, let's just be honest, the 21st century, number one, we are temperamentally reserved. We are, number two, we're socially restrained and we're theologically, number three, we're th theologically grounded in the doctrine of privilege. Number one, why is it that the 21st century uh, Christian find it difficult to go out and make disciples, number one, 
the 21st century church, the new church, the new Christians, nouveau Christians, we are temperamentally reserved. We don't want anybody talking to us about stuff we feel uncomfortable about. Hello, somebody. We don't talk about politics. We don't talk about God. And, you know, everybody knows that if you're socially astute, that that's not, you don't do that in public, right? And whereas in the old church, I'm telling you, it was no place in life that God was off limits. No place in life that God would, they, the old saints would break out and talk about the goodness of Jesus. I'm telling you, in Kroger parking lot, that they'll have a revival right there at the hospital. Somebody gets sick, they laying on hands. No, no, no. We're, we're temperamentally reserved. We're socially restrained, right? So it's, it's, there's a matter of our socialization, the way our socialization is set up. The way our socialization is set up, we make it seem that people that believe in God, people that believe in the laying on of hands, people that still speak in tongues, hello somebody, like the spirit gives them utterance, somehow they are uncouth. Somehow they are uncouth. And so we are, we are temporally, mentally reserved and we're socially restrained. We got this thing, we got this aura, we got this aura about us that we don't want to tell people, you know, what's going on, right? And then we got this privilege thing going on. We got this privilege, huh? Some of us that understand that uh, the, the church is a hospital will take your child to the hospital. They'll take your husband and your spouse to the hospital and take your cares to the hospital, but won't give anybody else the directions. Like it's a privilege to be a part of a, a church where God is moving and it's such a secret, you don't want to give it away. But if there's a shoe sale going on at Nike, you'll call 12 people. I wish I had somebody to say amen. But there, there's, a, there's another time and another way that I want you to think about this great commission and think about the time you have on your hands and think about the turnaround you need in your life and see if you can take this a little bit more seriously. When I began to read about the Great Commission, never before, never before has the number 11 jumped out at me. But when Jesus issued this Great Commission, he did not issue it to everybody. He didn't issue it to all 12 disciples that he had been mentoring that Jesus made and made Judas by this time, Judas by this time could have already committed suicide. He could have already hung himself. I don't know where Judas was, but Judas was not there when the great commission was given and they hadn't had the replacement for Matthias yet. And so he had the 11 of them this spoke volumes to me because there are people right now that won't move because you don't think you have enough with you. I know sometimes coming into church, you know, for 13 years, I've never had my entire church together at one time, at one place, at any given occasion. I don't care if it's the church anniversary. I don't care if it's the annual cookout. It doesn't matter, right? Somebody got something else going on, but what you have to do is go with the goers. You have to condition yourself in this season that you can't uh, be thrown off because there's one or two that will operate in disagreement. You can't be thrown off because everybody don't love what you're saying and everybody don't appreciate what you're doing. You just have to agree with yourself and God and go with the goers. So Jesus gave the 11, the 11 that was there, the 11 that was left, he gave them the great commission. Maybe that's the word for somebody else. Don't worry about who's left you. Don't worry about who is in an agreement with you. Gather what's left and go forward in Jesus' name. And so, uh, you know, he, this is what happened. He gave them the, the, the gift of, he gave them the gift of the great commission. I call it a gift 
because if it is that we are making disciples, if it is that we're able to share the gospel and help change people's lives, it is an absolute gift. It is an absolute gift. There are three things that I found very interesting in this great commission. It's basically the makeup of that, that sending, the makeup of the sending. There are three things that we have to understand and hone in on if you're going to take this great commission, which is our assignment, which is the church assignment, which is the believer's assignment, which is Christians. This is our, this is our purpose. It is to make disciples, right? And so there are three key words that you have to focus on. Number one, you got to go. This is a colossal failure of the church. Go. A colossal failure of the church. Why, Pastor? Because the church don't want to go outside the four walls. They want everybody to come to them. They want everybody to come to them. The sick need to come in to the altar call. Hello, somebody? The depressed need to come in to the altar call. Huh? Those who are bound by, by drug addictions and disease, they, they need to come on. But that's not what Jesus told us. He didn't say come. He told the disciples to go. That means that we need to get the gospel in our spirits, get our Bibles in our hands. Hello, somebody. Get a song book in your hand and you go out and meet them where they are. Go. You got to go. That's the first word of the Great Commission. It's, in, it's, in, it's, it's different for the church to say go because the church is not a proactive thing. It is not. It used to be proactive, but the church today is very passive. The church today is very reactionary. Something happens, then the church will mobilize. But the church is not on the forefront of anything life-changing. Hello, somebody? The church at large. Maybe one or two churches are. But the church at large, I don't see the churches hitting the streets, marching around uh, the hospitals. I don't see it. We got all the power, but it's housed in the building. And that's why many ministries and many churches are failing because they don't understand the commission is to go. When they, uh, our church normally meets in a school. We meet at Riverside High School. When they closed the school on the 12th uh, of March, I didn't flinch. Why? Because we are the church. And so that building being closed had nothing to do with the church doors being open. I simply went to Facebook. I simply went to Facebook and I started to go and we've been going ever since. I need somebody to hear me. You've been waiting for something to come to you. You've been waiting for people to come through your doors. Wait, wait, we can't meet. We cannot meet. So you're gonna have to go get them. We tell our members to start a watch party. That's activating the go part of this great commission. Go out there and get your friends. Go out there. We, we ask them to tag and share the message. That's a part of the go. Go out there and get them. Go out there. Because when we want to spread bad news and when we want to gossip, we don't have problems going. Oh, I wish I had one person to say amen. Yeah. To go means to take the initiative. It means to make the first move. What a novel thought for Christians, Antoine. Making the first move. Trying to find souls out here. Hello, somebody. We make the first moves when it's time to raise the offering. We give the musicians the eye to tell them play that marching music. And you just see people moving. Nobody's talking. The plates come out and we are... Come on now. Oh, they all want to talk about that. <laughs> but go and get a soul. When's the last time you went? When's the last time you answered that go, that call to go? 
Jesus is asking for us to go. Is it too much? Is it too much for you to go into your kid's room? Huh? Is it too much for you to go to that neighbor? Most people come to churches inside the building because somebody that they loved or trusted asked them to come. Is it, is it too hard for you to go to them now? Is it too hard for you to call somebody up and say, hey, listen, you know, I know we've been out of church for a while. You can find us on Facebook. You can find us at holyandhold.org. There's a good word. Don't miss it. All right? There's healing for your family. Don't miss it. We have to train ourselves and condition ourselves to go. We, the church got to get their go back. The church has to get their go back. Mm -hmm. Number two, the second step of fulfilling the Great Commission is to make disciples. He says, go, make disciples. He didn't say, go and recruit church members. But many of the churches treat church recruitment as if that is the same as discipleship. And that's not. Because you can invite your, uh, somebody to come to church and they like the music. And their lives never change. Hello, somebody. They come there. They like the people that's there. They like being a part of a big fancy church. They have great programs. That doesn't mean that their lives are going to change. That doesn't mean that they're ever going to become a disciplined follower of Christ. And so the church has lost their make. We got to get our make back. Make disciples. Make disciples. Stop making members and make disciples. It's hard to make a disciple when you don't have discipline. You don't have discipline. Think about it. If you grew up in the old church, how did the church mothers make disciples? My God in heaven. How did they make disciples? They met you at the church door. They watched what you had on and hello somebody. They gave you a big old hug. If you was in college, they stuck, stuck something in your hand, $5, a dollar and 50 cent. They made the disciples. They taught us how to love people. Yeah, they did. They taught us how to live holy. Hello, somebody. They had an expectation. They set us beside them on the, what they would call the morning bench. Hello, somebody. When we didn't know how to pray, they, they, I remember, I remember when I was a kid, I remember sitting beside uh, uh, my godmother in church. And I remember her on that first bench and she would come and they would begin to pray for prayer meetings. Oh, y'all don't know what I'm talking about. Prayer meeting. It was no singing. It was no music. No praise team. Huh? Prayer meeting. Prayer meeting. And so I was, uh, I, I don't know, I guess I was probably about eight or nine. And I, I didn't want to kneel all the way down. Because they had a tendency of being down there alone. And so I tried to have one knee, one knee up and one knee down, switching off knees for cushioning on the... <laughs> so this is what I did. I started praying with her. Whatever she was saying, I was saying it. Yes, Jesus, hallelujah. And I was just mimicking what she was saying. And I remember, and I could feel my godmother's, her name was Pauline Henderson, Sister Faith. I could feel her hand on my back pushing me lowering me, lowering me down until I was on both knees, until I was on both knees. I remember her squeezing my hand until I wasn't mimicking no more, that I could feel what she was feeling, that I could feel her very voice and breath as she was crying out to the father. I began to cry out for real. I began to cry out. I began to ask God to come into my heart too. She was discipling. She was modeling. She was modeling. When's the last time you've done it? When's the last time the church has done that? The discipline. Not just, you know, oh, well, our church has 30 days of training and then you become a full-fledged member. Not that. Not the four Sundays and you become a member or the six Sundays and you become a member. I'm talking about the disciplines where those who are disciplined will sit with those who are new to the faith and begin to share best practices.
This is how you pray. You don't need to sound fancy. You just need to come from your heart. You need to just speak what's in your heart. God knows all about it, right? A discipline that when you wake up, you need to read your Bible. You need to pray that you need to study so the word can get inside of you so that you can change your life and it'll help you. It'll give you guides. Yeah. Yeah. So that it builds your faith. And you begin to believe without doubt. Make disciples. The implication of making disciples is simply this. Disciples are not born. They are not born. Sometimes the church make you feel like you got to be born into it. You know, I'm born into it. Well, I, when I was born, uh, you know, I was already born on the mother's bench of the church. Nobody is born into this. We were born sinners. Hello, somebody? We weren't born saved. That is a selection that we make. That is a decision that we make to receive Christ and receive the gift of salvation, right? And to receive the Holy Spirit. That's a decision that we make, right? And so uh, the implication is we are not born, rather we're made. And the way that we're made is through discipline training. Whether that training is, you know, uh, us reading a Bible, right? You got to have a God. How can you hear? Huh? Without a preacher. And how can they preach if they haven't been sent? So this whole, you know, makeup, this whole life cycle hinges on discipline, being a disciplined follower. And it relies on the church to help give that training and that discipline. The church hasn't been very good in doing that, right? Because they are afraid to discipline. Because when you discipline, there's consequences now. Oftentimes when you uh, are disciplined, People don't like it. They leave your church, all right? When you tell them that they're off or you tell them that, hey, there's a better way, a more excellent way, they want to have their own way. And so when that happens, it causes people to, you know, to make a different decision and you lose members. But you can't be bothered by that. You must make disciples. You can't be afraid to fall out with friends. Hello, somebody. Sometimes God has to elevate your friendship, right? To a level where he can get the glory out of it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. When I first started Holy and Whole, I started with my friends. We were all partiers together. We used to have a good time, cook and eat out all the time, have parties together, celebrate our kids. It was fantastic. But at some point, God had to mature us. At some point, I had to move from friend to pastor. And for some, it sat well, and for others, it did not. Huh? But I kept on going. Good God Almighty. Because the Great Commission is more important than any friendship. That we had to make disciples. And sometimes, you may not be able to disciple your friends. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. God will send you some new folk to disciple. Keep going. The disciples had to keep going. I love it. Step three. Step three. He says, go ye therefore and make disciples, listen to this, of all nations, of all nations. Jesus does something that is popular today, but most people don't know the origins of diversity. He interjects diversity right here. He says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. He introduces inclusion and diversity right here. What are you talking about, pastor? He says, of all nations, don't just go and make disciples of people that look like you, people that think like you, people that worship like you. Make it of all nations. What are you saying? Hey, listen, the church needs to open its borders. Open its borders. Stop looking for the same folk. 
God didn't come for the saved people. He came for the sinners. And the church has a habit of always surrounding themselves with everybody that think like them. How are we going to make disciples if we don't find the folks that aren't disciplined? It's interesting. It's the church's easy way out. If you get the people that think like you, you don't have to work so hard. You don't have to be challenged when they have different thoughts. When they challenge some of these old traditions that we count as spiritual endowments. What happens when you can't fool people with the, you know, two sandwich hallelujah, and they need more than that because they need understanding about a real God. It's our tendency to do like the old folks would say, birds of a feather flock together. But God hasn't called us to that. He says, go ye therefore. He hasn't called us to go birds of feather flock together. He hasn't called us to that. We call ourselves to that. Why? Because we don't want to do the work. We don't want to do the work. And so I ask you to re-examine how you are making disciples. I ask you to look and see if you're going. If you're going, God is calling on us to go. Every single one of us has a part. The people that I can go and get, you may not be able to go and get them. The people that you can go and get, I may not be able to go and get them. But if we all go, the gospel will be spread to the ends of the earth. If we all make, before we make somebody else, we need to make sure that we're made. We need to make sure that we're made, that we're, dis we're disciplined, that our habits are clear. Not that just we're repeating the words, that we're not just hearers of the words, but we're actually doers of the word. And so when you become a doer, you can show someone else how to do. When you're not a doer, you can't show people how to do. Yeah, make disciples. Go, make disciples, and be inclusive. This gospel is not just called to Christians. It's called to everyone. You often see me in the community working with the interfaith groups, the Sikhs, the Hindus, Muslims, anybody. I work with them. Why? Because God made all of us. And I don't know I don't know if I will have the opportunity to make a disciple outside of our church. So I work in the community. I let them see the goodness of Jesus. I let them experience the Holy Spirit. This Thursday coming up is the National Day of Prayer. In Loudoun, we have the Interfaith Day of Prayer. The Loudoun Interfaith Day of Prayer. It is a day, uh, it is a actual meeting that um, I found it through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit told me, he says, listen, go ye therefore make disciples. This day of prayer is not just set aside for Christians only. Pray. Let's pray. So I gathered the community. Didn't matter. Hindus, uh, my friends from the Adams Center my friends from our Sikh community, my friends from Hindu community. We all came together. Um, my Presbyterian friends, every different denomination. We all came together and we decided that we would do the Interfaith Day of Prayer. And every year we do it. And every year something miraculous happens. Every year we find a way to become closer and to show the love of God who binds us all to show him freely in the earth realm. I would encourage you to join us right here this year for the Interfaith Day of Prayer, the National Day of Prayer. We're going to have it at 11 o'clock and we're going to spend some good time praying with each other. 
I don't know about you, but I know that God hasn't put us in time out for us to miss the message. And the message is to go make disciples of all nations. Tell somebody about the love of Jesus Christ. Tell somebody about the goodness of the risen Savior. Tell somebody that there's a man in Galilee. And if you need healing, he can set you free. Yeah, yeah. God bless you. Maybe there's somebody here that's on their way to Pentecost, on their way to the day where they receive power, on their way to a turnaround, on their way to the best days of their lives. But you know that you can't do this on your own, that this walk was never meant for you to walk alone, that Jesus wants to be your guide. He wants to be your shepherd. He wants to be your all in all. He has great plans for you. And maybe you're here and you're mature enough to where you want to accept those plans for your life. And if you're here and you want to receive Christ today, you're here and you feel something in your spirit. You're here and you feel a tug in your spirit. I just want you to type, I want to get saved. I want to get saved. Just type. I know you're here and I know there's somebody out here every week without fail. The Lord has been drawing people to himself. We're not drawing you to holy and whole. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. We're drawing you to a kingdom, to the family of God, where your healing is yours. Deliverance is, is yours. And God has the ability to set you free from anything that could have ever kept you bound. Maybe you're here and you said yes to the Lord before. You made that walk down the aisle, but somehow life has found you in a backwards motion. Life has found you distracted, disturbed by many things, and you sort of turned away from God. This is a great time to rededicate yourself to Christ. It's a great time to give your life to him. Because when you put your life in God's hands, the turnaround is sure. When you put your life in God's hands, trust me, he'll make it better than anything that you can believe. He'll do things with you, through you, and for you that you never dreamed. Maybe you're here and you say, Lord, I, I, I've turned away from you. I've gotten sidetracked. I've gotten distracted, but I want to come back to you. If you're here, just say, I want to rededicate my life. Just type, I want to rededicate my life. This is the time. This is the time. This, I won't go another day without you, God. I won't go another day without you leading me. If you're here and you resonate with that, why don't you just type, I want to get saved right or i want to rededicate my life maybe you're here and you're connected with jesus and you're on a straight and narrow but you don't have a church home doesn't matter where you are it doesn't matter where you are you can join us at holy and whole we've had people to join holy and whole from england We've had people to join from Jamaica and Canada, all over the world. We have people connecting with Holy and Home. Why don't you just join? Say, hey, if you want to join our church, you want to join uh, Holy and Whole, if you want a place where you can get plugged in and be discipled, get plugged in and be empowered, get plugged in and be inspired so you can go there for and make disciples, why don't you just type in, I want to join Holy and Whole. I want to join Holy and Whole. Perhaps you're here and you just need prayer. Doesn't matter what's going on in your life, God can handle it. Not only can he handle it, he can fix it. That our God is a God that knows all about it. 
So if you're here, if you're here and you need prayer, why don't you just type? Our deacons and our ministers are online and they are waiting. They are waiting. They are waiting. They'll message you. They'll connect right with you. And let's bring our concerns, our petitions to God. How many people know that God is the one that can handle it? Doesn't make sense you crying by yourself. God can fix it. Doesn't make sense you complaining and getting frustrated. God has a way. He said he'll give us all a way of escape. Hello, somebody. Doesn't matter what you're into. God can get, make a way of escape. Yep. Yep. Healing is for you. Deliverance is for you. Hallelujah. Salvation is for you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He can heal the brokenhearted. He can heal the brokenhearted. Let me just start calling out families that I know. The Whitlow family in, Arla, in, in Albany, Georgia. Pastor Whitlow and her husband. They passed on this week, Monday. And so if you could just keep the Whitlow family in prayer, the Church of the Kingdom of God, keep them in prayer. Keep the Kojic churches in prayer. Come on, can somebody just keep Charlotte Lofton in prayer? She lost her sister. Huh? Come on, pray with us. Pray with us. If you have a concern, just write it. Doesn't matter what it is, we'll take it to the Lord in prayer. Father, you know all about it. You know the hairs that's numbered on our head. There's nothing too hard for you, Lord. So we ask you to lift our heads. We call out the Turner family today. We call out the Lawson family today. We call out the Grayson family, the Haley family today. Lord, we put them on the altar of love. We put them on the altar of healing. We put them on the altar of comfort and strength and guidance, Lord. Lord, you know all about it. Lord, we thank you for Elder Maddie and all whom she served, all of the churches, Oak Grove, hallelujah, Mount Zion. We pray right now for those members that she's connected with, all of the United Methodist churches, Chantilly Baptist, Holy and Whole, all that she have befriend in this kingdom work together. Lord, we ask that you lift us up. Hallelujah, hallelujah. 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 Those that are in the hospital, those who are on respirators, Lord, we ask that you would just interrupt it right now in the name of Jesus. Breathe your Ruha breath in their lives right now. Raise them up from their sick bed and their point of affliction, God. Heal their bodies, heal their minds, heal their spirits. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Hallelujah. There's nothing hidden from you. Nothing hidden from you. Nothing hidden from you. Cover Loudon. Cover Virginia. Cover America. Cover the globe. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name we pray. Listen, you may be here and you need someone to talk to. You need someone to share with. Listen, nothing's too hard for God. And we have his representatives right here on the line. If you need help in any way, reach out. Just type it. Just type it. And we will be there. We will be there. We will be there. Maybe you're here and you want to give. You want to give, you want to give to the ministry. You want to support the ministry in some way. I want you to go now to Holy and Whole, H-O-L-Y-A-N-D-W-H-O-L-E.org. Holyandwhole.org. If you look at the top of your screen, you'll see a give button. Click the give button to leave your tithes, your offering, and even your donations. And why don't you give now? give now before we end can you just tag like and share this video 
Maybe there's somebody that's going to need it. Maybe there's somebody that needs the love of God. Maybe there's somebody that needs the steps to encourage them to get on task right where they are. Make disciples. You don't have to wait until COVID-19 is open and the church doors are open again to make disciples. Start making them in your house. Hello, somebody. Make them in your neighborhood, on your streets. Hello, somebody. Make them on your, in, uh, uh, next door to your workmates, on your jobs. Take Jesus with you everywhere you go. We know it's only one way to leave a holy and whole service. That's going forward. We can't go back. We won't go back. We headed to Pentecost and we will not go back. How many people know that you want to, that you need to go forward? There's something that Jesus had given us as a way to move forward. And the way to move forward is to remember what Christ has done for us. It's communion Sunday. I hope you got your communion ready. Let's just take a few moments and prepare our hearts and minds and prepare ourselves for communion. Can we just take a few moments? Minister Antoine is going to give us some music so that we can prepare for communion. You have your families just grab, well, what do I need for communion? Listen, keep it simple. If you have crackers, juice, right? Get your crackers, your juice. I don't have crackers or juice. You got toast, you got bread. Hallelujah. Get that together and let's share communion. The Bible says as often as we do this, we show the Lord's death until he returns. And there's no greater thing than God has done for us than to send his son to shed his blood on Calvary for the remissions of our sins. So can we just gather ourselves? Can we just give a moment to gather and get your communion sacrament ready? your hands over your sacrament and let's bless it father we ask that you would bless this sacrament make it holy and acceptable unto you now thank you father for this opportunity to commune with you 
Father, we ask that you would forgive us of any sins, anything that we've done willingly, or knowingly or unknowingly. Lord, we ask that you would forgive us. Lord, cleanse us with hits up now as we celebrate your death, burial, and resurrection through your ordinance, the Lord's Supper now. In Jesus' name we pray with thanksgiving. I'm going to share this communion with Brother Anthony. Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread. He broke it. He says, this is my body, which is broken for you. Take, eat all of it. And after the same manner, took the cup of wine. He says, this is my blood that I shed on Calvary for you, for the remissions of your sins. Take, drink all of it. Hallelujah. And as often as you do this, you show the Lord's death until he returns. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you for your blood. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for keeping us. Now, God, we ask that you would just be with us that you would give us power, fill us up with your spirit, lead us and guide us. In Jesus' name we pray, hallelujah. Can you just thank God? I am so grateful that you joined us today. I am so grateful that you joined us today. And I pray that God will continue to be with you throughout this week, that you will find favor and you will find rest in him, in him. God is our help in the time of trouble. Hello, somebody. Oh, my, my, my. Can we just celebrate the Lord? Come on, Antoine. Let's leave with a good, on a good note. Let's take it back. Come on, put your hands together, saints. Yes. I know it was the blood.
you, Donna. I see you, Donna. Hey, hey. Come on, why don't you just praise him? Come on. I see you, Janine. Just go on and praise him. Hey. That's it, Diallo. Just go on and praise him, Brian. Just go on and praise him. Thank you. 
agree. We have a hope, an everlasting hope in Jesus Christ. So we know we're going to see Elder Maddie again. Come on, somebody say, well done, that good and faithful servant. Well done. Good and faithful. Yeah. Well done. You can meet us right back here every Sunday at 11 o'clock, every Wednesday, hello somebody, at 7.30. Our children will be meeting in Zoom at 3 o'clock. They also meet uh, Fridays for a check-in at 6 o'clock. Listen, we are here for you. We are here for you. God bless you. May God keep you. May his face shine on you. And you have a fantastic week. Go, 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 go. Make disciples. Go, make disciples. Hello, somebody. Be inclusive. Go, make disciples. Be inclusive. Hallelujah. Come on, we'll see you later. Come on, let's praise him. Yay! God bless you. Until next week. Well done. Good and faithful servant. Well done.